Well, thank you, Jonas, for that fantastic presentation and uh, for your talk on bringing us back to us without the us and them divide. So thank you for that. Um, in the morning, I was given the wonderful task of wel welcoming you. And now I am given the not very wonderful task of telling you the lunch is going to be 15 minutes late. <laughs> but I hope that you will yeah, live with that and uh, we can continue with a discussion. So what I want to do now, I started off in the morning with Shakespeare and I'll continue with that. All the life's a stage, said Shakespeare, and all men and women mere players. And one man in his time plays many parts. And having brought you to the stage as participants in this event, I hope all of you will play your part because there is no us and them. There are no presenters and audience here. We are all part of the script. And the script can only work if you, all of you participate in the discussion by contributing your thoughts, by raising questions, by asking questions, and by sharing some of your experiences. So I hope you will all do that. What I would now like to do is to maybe invite Nancy and Jonas, if you can maybe come somewhere, wherever you feel comfortable. And uh, both of you, we don't want to delay the lunch any longer than is absolutely essential. So <laughs> I, will, I will just uh, ask a, a question to each one of you, and then maybe we can throw it open to all of the others. Um, Nancy, when I heard you speak, and all of it was very familiar, territory. You come from the United States and I'm from India and we seem to speak the same kind of language. And uh, you said, you talked about this surveillance uh, you know, machinery that, that, that uh, oversees all of us. And uh, you also <coughs> talked about uh, the uh, public, uh, uh, the war on terror and the way in which it makes anybody who has anything to do with a so-called terrorist complicit and therefore, you know, potentially a criminal or, or can be criminalized themselves. So, you know, and we have seen a lot of this in my country, you know, like we have somebody can just, some, uh, you know, is a person from the same village and gives food and then you have the whole anti-terrorism laws or somebody who passes through or, uh, you know, is, happens to be a brother, has a cup of tea with somebody in the tea shop and they can straight away be charged with terrorism. But I was also uh, reminded of a legislation we had, which is 1876, called uh, the Vernacular Press Act. And then the Vernacular Press Act, we're talking of 1876 here. Vernacular Press Act kind of did the same sort of thing. If you wrote something that was, you know, vaguely sympathetic or anything, you could be charged with, you know, offenses against the state. I think that is the section and the chapter it was called. So the question that was passing through my mind is some of these things, I mean, you, you seem to say that 9-11 is a turning point and things the world somehow changed after 9-11. But for those of us who come from the colonies, these things have been around for a very, very long time. I remember the first anti-terrorism legislation in my country was 1914. So is this the question I want to ask you, Nancy, is, is this just an enlargement of scale? Something that happened, you know, Britain, and it's between Britain and its colonies, or is this something qualitatively different that we are seeing after 9-11? Well, <clears throat> we've certainly had it. We've always had it. We've had it for a long, long time. But I think that 9-11 gave 
um, an opportunity. For example, the Patriot Act, which we've all heard of, which was passed by Congress right after 9-11, it, it, it was sitting there waiting for something to happen, waiting for there to be an excuse. And 9-11 became an excuse to expand what we already had. Plus the fact that we now are capable of having drones and are capable of the surveillance that we didn't have before, it all gave the excuse to expand it. That's the technology, it you mean? The technology gave an excuse. Uh, the technology was there, but now it had an opportunity to flower, as it were. Um, the Patriot Act, the ideas behind the Patriot Act, the ideas behind this kind of extended surveillance and this extended need for secrecy and the idea that we have to all continue to be afraid. I mean, I live in a country that's always been afraid. We, we were created by fear. We were created, the country was created uh, with us and others. That's, that's how my country was created. It's always been that way. It's not something new. But the technology, I think, uh, gave the opportunity, and 9-11 gave that opportunity to the people who wanted to have an excuse. That's all it was, just an excuse to expand it all. But then just picking up on uh, another thing that you said about whistleblowing you know, and, and the legislation, um, you know, how whistleblowing is not, you know, um, uh, espionage and the distinction and so on. Uh, when the whistleblowing, uh, whistleblowers legislation came in, I think many of us uh, thought, oh, this was going to be great because it was actually going to protect whistleblowers and that is how it was sold to the public, that is going to you know, protect and therefore if there was a real good reason to actually blow the whistle, then the law would protect you. So how do you explain that, the, the justification for that legislation and the way we are, it's being used now? Well, it, it's never worked as uh, any kind of protection. There's never been any protection for whistleblowing in the national security area. Contractors aren't even covered by the legislation as I understand it. And I don't believe there's ever been an example of anyone going through the, quote, channels and being effective because when somebody in the Central Intelligence Agency or the NSA or one of those goes and complains, that person gets put under suspicion. And that has happened consistently. So ever since the beginning, um, and it, it simply hasn't worked and it's not going to work. And it's not going to work because there is this impression in those agencies that anyone who speaks out against them must be some kind of a subversive. But that's how it was sold to us, right? That's how it was sold to us. <laughs> right, okay. Um, does anyone have a question for Nancy? or a comment on anything she said. It doesn't have to be a Q&A or a comment or some thoughts on her talk that you would like to, like to share. Yes? I have one for each of you. Uh, would it be possible for uh, a mic, yeah? I feel like I'm in one of those revolving restaurants. It is actually revolving, yes. <laughs> Not a bad place to be. No, no. <laughs> I have a question for both of them. We can, I could practice a big voice while he's working at that. My question to Nancy was on um, when she's talking about um, the man who was accused of cooperating with Hamas by doing the work with the children. Um, I have heard that during the times of Fatah and uh, Israel supported Hamas in the beginning when Hamas was born, nobody saw the threat started, and I've heard that Israel 
support of Hamas in order to weaken Fatah. That's correct. And so, so the question is uh, how somehow that isn't known knowledge or something. How could they, uh, how could it be official that they supported Hamas to tabala po, ta rota po, uh, to take a, what's it called, you know, to, 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 to destroy Fatah, and at the same time accuse somebody taking care of children for collaborating with Hamas? That's my question to you, well, and then I have one for him, but I When Hamas was first uh, began about 1987, the, the Israelis did think that it was <clears throat> a, a means to um, control or take over Fatah, that it was a religious organization. It was encouraged um, at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, Hamas then engaged in a number of suicide bombings, and that <clears throat> pretty much changed the situation. Um, but my client was never charged with any suicide bombing, although the jury saw the same bus getting blown up about ten times during the course of a very long, two very long trials. But um, at, at this point, what I believe has happened is that <clears throat> anyone who provides any kind of assistance in Palestine easily gets accused of supporting Hamas. The one other thing that I'll say that I think of, of it is, is essential is that Shukri and his co-defendant are serving 65 years, 65 year sentences. In Israel there was a similar prosecution of a group of people who were Palestinian as my clients were and who were accused of aiding Hamas and their sentence was five years. So in, in Israel, which is the country at issue, the sentence was five years. In the United States, the sentence was 65 years. Any thoughts on Nancy's talk or her comments later? Anyone wishes? Yes. I'm over there. Um, I have a, works? Yeah. No? Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Um, Nancy, I wanted to, to ask you, um, you said that we have a right to know about something uh, uh, as citizens in order to protect democracy, but how, uh, on, based on which criteria uh, this right to know can be developed? How to differentiate between something we have a right to know and uh, what you called also legitimate secret of, of the state? You know, the, the government says that it has the right, and most governments use this, to protect its sources and methods. It's, way, it's kind of sources and methods. Um, <clears throat> there are certain things that, that governments do. Our governments engage in wars against each other, whether we like it or not. Um, we have um, people who are attempting to overthrow governments for illegitimate reasons. Um, we have um, various things that governments must keep secret. But they're very limited. And the problem is, in, certainly in my country, and I think it's true in others, two things have expanded. What is, quote, classified evidence? What is the evidence that the government considers too dangerous to expose or it would expose national security? That that list of that evidence, that information has vastly expanded. At the same time, the concept of national security has expanded. So what is national security? If those two expand, then everything gets put under the rubric of sources and methods. And I can give you one very quick example. Um, a year or so ago, five men were released from Guantanamo in exchange for a prisoner from the Taliban, a man named uh, Bergdahl. And those five men who were released, about a day before their release, what we were told was that they would never be released because national security would suffer if these five men were released because they were so dangerous. And then the next day they were released. So what does it mean to say national security. What does it mean to say that something has to be kept secret? 
Muhammad al Salahi's book was secret. It took six years to get out what we should have known all along. So that's the problem, is that the governments have expanded what they call, is ne what they claim is necessary, and therefore we don't have any idea what they're doing. And at the same time, they're spying on us, so they get to know everything about us. I mean, it's really a, not a very difficult concept. It's pretty simple. It's simply that governments have to be limited to what is actually necessary to be kept secret. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, when it comes to surveillance of the people, no, uh, most people think it's a good thing. They don't, they're not scared of it. They think that, oh, government is just doing it for my safety and security. And um, John Oliver did an enquete uh, on uh, Manhattan uh, asking people, do you know who Snowden is? And almost nobody knew. They thought that he was a guy that uh, gave away secrets that threatened the security of the United States. <clears throat> and um, what made them think was when he said, would you like that the government saw the dick pics you're sending to your girlfriend? And they were like, shocked that the government can actually see the dick pics they're sending to their girlfriends. That's when they kind of woke up. So how do you see any possibility of uh, <laughs> people caring about surveillance, if that's... You know, I always say that the fastest way to turn in the U.S. a Republican into a Democrat is to make that person a defendant. Um, <laughs> Because then they see what happens. Then they see how the system comes down on them. And I don't know except through education. Um, unfortunately, I live in a country that has a pretty low level of literacy. Um, it's much higher here. In the US, I tell people I went to Mauritania and they say, where is that? Um, everyone in this room, I will bet, knows where Mauritania is. Um, but there's virtually not one out of 25 Americans who do. So it's in, in my country, it's, it, that's the problem. But I think that's the problem all over the world, is people don't really see how it harms us until we get harmed. And all we can do is try our best to explain to people that when others are getting harmed, it harms us too. And I don't know how else to do that except like through the work that Jonas does, that it explains that to the world. Okay. Um, I think we need, I would like to move on to Jonas, and maybe we can come back to some more questions in the second half of uh, the session, or the last part of today's session. So hold on to your questions, everyone, and we will you know, come back to them. But Jonas, when you were... You seem to, I mean, you were saying, we live in, a, in this republic of fear. Yeah? And that kind of drives a lot of our responses <coughs> and some of the questions that, were, that came in response, I think somebody here, uh, on you know, what do you do when people don't know or people live in fear and they voluntarily become complicit in this whole thing. And when you were speaking, uh, I, were, I remembered, you know, uh, my grandmother, <laughs> bless her. <laughs> they are always the most wonderful people in our lives, I'm sure all of you here share that. And when we were growing up, she used to insist that we knew the epics. You know, it was not enough to read novels and to read all of that and to read, you know, philosophy and theory. And she used to say, you must read the epics. And of course, we have the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, big epics, and epics have been. But when I think about it, because she used to say, because you need to read epics because you can tell the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And she used to say, it builds your inner 
strength, that you become strong inside by reading epics. Now, I don't want to put that out as a theory, but I did, remem I did remember her because if you look at the epics, and there is a lot of art in it, because there is drama, there is music, there is ballads, there is heroes, heroines, action. It's very action-packed, the epics. But there is always hero, and it's always a battle between good and bad, yeah, good and evil. I wondered when you were saying, you know, what should art be? Should art be, you know, engaged with politics, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, whether it is the absence or somehow our reluctance to actually say, yes, there is something called right and wrong. We can talk about what is right and what is wrong. There is something called right and wrong. There is something called, you know, the society, the world, which we need to live as human beings. That, and I wondered whether it is taking that away from art <coughs> that has actually created this, you know, the inner fear, the loss of what my grandmother would call inner strength that then allows us to become fear. Government says, oh, we have to take pictures of you. Government says, you have to give up your you know, private data, pictures of your dick, whatever, to, oh, for national security, and we actually do it. We, we, we think, oh yes, you know, otherwise I'm going to be destroyed. And I wondered if you can speak to that a bit on how art can actually build up that inner strength. Right. Well, I mean, first of all, my argument would be that, a, that, that a, a large majority of art, or at least where the largest part of the economy of art is focused on in our contemporary times, is actually in support, conscious or unconscious, of um, the values and beliefs and the ideas of right and wrong as have been propagated through, um, through, the war, through war on terror propaganda. And on that follows war on terror propaganda art. But by analyzing it, I think there are simultaneously a set of potential alternatives that emerge. Like, for example, the interesting thing for, about some of these movies that, were, that also had Pentagon subsidized uh, support. So Pentagon doesn't directly finance <laughs> Hollywood films, for example, uh, but it grants subsidies to military personnel. But then in exchange, it wants to control scripts. So in important films, like for example, Charlie Wilson's War was a popular film with Tom Hanks. It was about the relationship between the CIA and the Taliban. In order to get military support to make this film, the Pentagon said, um, we want these and these and these parts of the scripts removed or changed that make visible that there is also a link between the support of the Taliban and the emergence of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And that is, of course, very important in relationship to the previous question about how we narrate history and who controls our history and the role that art plays in visualizing our history and what information we get and which we don't get. So I think the other side of the story is how do we narrate these other histories, these lost histories? Like I was thinking also in your previous discussion that we live in a very strange time where where never before has so much new information instantly become classified. Like we've never created so much classified mm -hmm. history about our own lives and classified retrospectively so much about our own histories, which is dangerous in terms of trying to understand where we come from, what does our present mean and what are our possible future scenarios. And I think art has a role in trying to articulate what these future scenarios could be to find ways uh, through the mazes of the legal and political system, economic system, to articulate an alternative. And in some way, um, Guantanamo Diary, the book that Nancy discussed by Mohamedou Tslai, I think is a very good example of that. Of course, Mohamedou became a kind of a writer, an artist, through his time in prison, in, in the war prison, if you can call Guantanamo Bay really a prison in any conventional terms, a sense of the word. And what was so powerful about his, about his text, apart from the fact that it is incredible, beautiful, anti-imperialist also text, um, was the presence of these two languages, that you had Mohamedou's writing, and then you had these censored black blocks all around the pages. 
And in, in a way, it showed two forms of writing confronting each other. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk about like the good or bad, or at least of, of an ethics, this is the place where these ethics come together. You have the ethics of a person who's been in jail for 15 years without ever having any charge made against him, and that embodies the ultimate terror of the war on terror in that sense, and that tries to regain a voice, grip, sense of resistance, dignity, through writing, through art. And then you have these black blocks, this writing without signature in a way. His writing you can trace to a person, and this you cannot, because we don't know how many censors went through this text. So it can be tens of people, these anonymous and violent uh, abstractions that take our history away from us and our capacity of self-determination. And sometimes even censors the strangest things. Like there is a sentence where, where I read... Um, at that moment, I, I couldn't hold on anymore. I just fell down and block. And I thought, is that, is he, wh what could that, that have been? should be, is it that cried? <laughs> like, is, is the fact that this man cried censored? And then in, somewhere in the footnotes, Larry Seems, the editor, indeed writes, it seems nearly impossible to imagine but it, that the censor actually has censored a human emotion out of the text itself. So this is a very long and associative yeah. answer, maybe in some sense, but for me that book as an artwork is a very important one because it shows exactly this ethical conflict that yeah. you were describing when it comes to which position do we take as, as artists and how do we make visible which sides we, are, we can choose between. This anonymized violence that takes our, away our history or those who try to regain voice <coughs> with, with any means necessary. But uh, I think one of the things that, uh, if, if I understood you correctly, you seem to be saying, I mean, you know, there was a time when art showed the mirror, you know, showed society in the mirror to us through art. So when Tolstoy writes about Anna Karenina, you kind of feel, oh, what must it be like to be a woman in that kind of society? And he evokes that emotion and what it means. So in a way, shows, you know, shows you the society through art. Uh, what you seem to be saying is that now art creates a new reality. It doesn't show the mirror to reality, but it creates a new reality by the fictionalizing art and, and, and the whole thing that you took us through, a lot of which is, of course, supported by you know, academic theories like game theories and so on, you know, you have a game, you intervene and then figure out what might happen if you throw something in and then you kind of make that into a policy and say, you know, if, if we intervene in this way, the reality will change in those kind of ways. So I was wondering if you can just comment on, you know, this, this, this new role, if you like, of fiction, which mm. creates new reality. Mm instead of just showing us the reality. Yeah. And are you saying that we should actually go back to art which shows us, you know, the image or the reality in a mirror image? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think art is, has never only been a mirror of society. It, it is always a product of society and often it is a product of uh, structures of ownership. And uh, that means that art has always stood in, in a uh, largely dependent relationship of ruling powers. So it's not strange that the most expensive artworks of our time, in the form of Hollywood disaster cinema, would benefit the most powerful actors of our time, in the form of expanded state. So the public-private constellation that defines what we currently call uh, our, our, um, our government. Um, so in that sense, art has always been an expression of, of power, but then ha also always has a parallel history in which artists somehow try to challenge power or uh, join alternative oppositional political forces from the idea that art by itself cannot change the world, but it can imagine the world differently. If we want to achieve a different world, we'll have to imagine it first. If I don't know what, what I'm acting for, then how do I act? Yeah. And in that sense, art doesn't have, doesn't have political power, but it has this imaginative power. Uh, and as such, it, it can contribute a great deal to alternative emancipatory movements, um, maybe even articulate new ideas of 
what is a people, who is us in the us, them uh, divide. But I do think it is very important to be allied. Like for example, the way we are standing here today um, as, as an activist academic and an activist lawyer and an activist artist, I think these are also important assemblies because um, we link our disciplines and our, very, our relative power to one another. And it is only through these alliances that I believe art will have an actual role in bringing structural alternatives about. So the collaboration with the autonomous government of Rojava is, is an example yes, of that. Yes, and you do that very well, and, and, and you do that everywhere. So, you know, making these alliances and collaborations. Um, just a question or two, th some thoughts on Jonas's presentation before we break up for lunch. Yes, Eric. Yes. You said two questions, or? No, no, I, I thought on what, what you call these uh, Hollywood movies. This right. Movie. Why do I call Hollywood movies art? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, d I define myself as an artist, but my, my art work is, or what I define as my artwork is very multidisciplinary in nature. So I work in uh, visual art, architecture, design, film, writing, performance, etc. I consider that the success of war on terror propaganda is also its interrelated, interdisciplinary character. Uh, film is one of them, theater is one of them, these were the examples I, I, I took now, um, and I could have named many, many more. In that interconstellation, I talk about it as art. Within that, we can then start to distinguish this specific work operates through the medium of cinema, or this one through that of the computer game, or whatever, or literature, or. But the importance, of course, is that none of these artworks um, makes us convinced that an imminent threat exists, a fictional imminent threat is actually real. You have to take them into consideration in their interrelatedness. There's no... Uh, a crucial part of propaganda is its permanent presence in all forms and disciplines. It, can, it will never... Propaganda never influences us if it is not... Uh, through, uh, through monopolizing our imagination. Whether I turn to my computer, whether I turn to film, whether I turn to theater, it has to tell me all the time the same thing in order for me to slowly shift my ethical consciousness to be able to support what is actually unsupportable, the invasion of other countries, mass murder in the name of the defense of democracy. Before you can get the people there, you need this continuous uh, structuring of a mindset, of an imagined threat. And film is, is one of them, but it is only, it is only a fragment of the, the art that is war on terror propaganda art. Would be my argument. Okay, on that note, I think we need to stop for lunch. It wouldn't be fair to people to hold you back from your lunch. But please do hold on to your questions, and we will come back to them later in the afternoon. Thank you.